I often show this chart because I, I want to drill it into your heads, all the benefits that you get from this wonderful business of investing in real estate. Tonight, I'm going to spend some time talking about tax benefits that you get from owning real estate. It's pretty phenomenal. And I'll tell you a couple of stories about it. So these are just some of the things that you get from a piece of real estate. You get security. You have a place for your family to grow up and live in. You get to use the property, but you can also sell the use of the property by renting your property to somebody else and getting paid for it. Okay? Amateurization. It's a minor benefit. Basically, you're making mortgage payments or your tenants making the mortgage payments to you and you're paying it to the mortgage company and you're getting some principal pay down. It's nothing to get excited about if anybody's ever looked at those charts. The cash flow is great. It's, uh, the cash flow is the additional funds that you're getting, the difference between your mortgage payment and your and your um, rental payment, okay? Management, that's, that's a category everybody loves, right? Well, that's the work you got to do to get all these amazing benefits. You've got to manage this property, okay? And profits, okay? You get profits when you refi your property or when you sell your property. And you get growth almost every year just from real estate going up most of the time, okay? There are, there are exceptions to that. So tonight, let's talk a little bit about the tax benefits, and I'm going to tell you some stories. Okay, so what are the tax implications of selling your primary residence? Well, we have some pretty cool tax benefits on that, all right? So let's just say you're an individual. You're not married, all right? Your principal residence is a capital asset, okay? You must hold the property for more than a year or have lived in your property for two out of the last five years. It's pretty easy to show if you live there, you know, utility bills, they usually ask for simple things like that, okay? It's called the principal residence exclusion. So you can sell your principal residence if you're a single person, okay? Say you bought it for 500000 and you sold your house for 800000 You made a $300,000 profit. You get a $250,000 exclusion on your property. So if you made 300 grand with your primary residence, you only have to pay taxes on $50,000 of the money you made. Pretty good deal, right? Okay. If you're married, it's twice as much. So same exact example, all the same rules. You made $300,000 in profit. A married couple has a half a million dollar exclusion. So if you made anything under half a million dollars, you don't pay any taxes on selling your primary residence. Anybody here want to move to Florida? Thousand people a day are moving to Florida. You could take your house, sell it, not pay any taxes on it, go down to Florida where the houses were cheaper. I don't know that they are anymore. The market down there is, is on fire like crazy. And But if you had done this five years ago, you probably would have put a hundred grand in your pocket easy. Uh, maybe even more than that. I mean, because the houses down there were a lot cheaper than they are selling for up here. I don't know that that exists anymore. But married couple gets half a million dollar exclusion, so it's a nice little benefit, right? One of the, just one of the things you can do with the uh, tax benefits of real estate. All right, so now let's talk about a house that is not your primary residence, which makes it an investment property, okay? That's what we're, most of us are going to be buying. Most of us are going to be buying properties as investment properties, all right? So the 1031 exchange program is the, the program that you're going to use if you want to sell some of your investment properties. You could sell one property into and buy another property with it, or you could sell multiple properties and buy something really cool like a big office building or something, okay? So the rules are... You get 45 days to identify three addresses of potential homes that you want to purchase. And the government likes to say it has to be like-kind exchange. I'm here to tell you for sure nobody ever checks that, okay? I sold four houses and bought an office building with 47 offices. 
It there ain't nothing like kind exchange. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and call him. You'd be lucky if anyone even answers that phone. <laughs> All right. So they tell you it has to be like kind exchange. I don't know. What what exactly does that mean? Best I can tell it means absolutely nothing. All right? You can if you had a bunch of rural homes in Philadelphia, and there'll probably be some great opportunities to buy a bunch of rural homes in Philadelphia or in in suburban areas, okay? But specifically in Philly, because they've had a moratorium on evictions. So if you're a landlord and your tenant's not paying you for like a year, there's like nothing you can do about it. So I see a wave of foreclosures coming in a place like Philadelphia in the next year or two. I think that it's just going to be inevitable. It's going to have to happen. And then you've got all this COVID stuff where we're shutting down all these restaurants and businesses. So we're going to have, I, I got an email today, somebody wants to sell me a restaurant in Trenton, right? You know, this is the kind of stuff that's going to start coming across your desk. These, these restaurants, any property that was a restaurant, okay, you could try to repurpose it if you're looking to get some commercial properties. I tr guarantee houses and commercial properties are going to become something of an abundance. If you are a landlord who hasn't been getting paid, during, you know, 2020, they still have not opened up the courts to begin evictions. They still haven't done it. When they open it up, it's going to be like 3 million people are getting evicted. The system never worked in the regular system. It never worked. So there, you got no chance in hell of getting these people out in a, in a timely manner. I mean, I really feel for these landlords, because I think they're just going to give up, and these things are just going to go to foreclosure, and um, you want to start buying lists of people who are in foreclosure, and you want to start talking to those people, try to, maybe if they're not too deep behind, maybe they're only five grand behind, you can put up five grand of your own money, and now the house is current again, and you can take over the loan subject to, or, or you could do a short sale, so there's definitely some some strategies you can use here. All right. So if you identify three addresses that you're thinking about buying and you are going to sell one of the properties that you have or even multiple properties you have, you have 180 days to sell the old property and buy the new one. Okay. As long as you can do all of this in the time that the government gives you to do it. Okay. You'll be golden, and you don't have to pay any taxes on the properties that you sell, okay? So the, the key thing is you cannot touch the money. The money has to be transferred into what's called a qualified intermediary, which is, uh, I like to say, stranger danger, because this is scary as hell to me, all right? I sold four houses that I owned they were all row homes in Philly, nothing. One was in Parkwood, one was in Morrell, one was on the boulevard, like, um, like down near Haldeman in the boulevard. I forget where the other one was. And um, these four houses, I sold them all. I got approximately 100 grand from each one. And now I'm going to take $400,000 of my money and give it to some lawyer who I don't even know, and he sticks it in his escrow account. I tell you, that scared the heck out of me. I thought, like, you know, a guy could have two, three million bucks. He could have five million bucks in that account. What's to stop him from uh, hopping on a plane and hitting town? Why do you have to give the money to him? If you touch the money in a 1031 exchange, if any of that money comes to you, it's now taxable and cannot be used in the 1031 exchange. So make sure that you don't. You, you could always, maybe you're making 400 grand off the buildings that you're selling, and you wanted to take 50 grand, you're allowed to do that. You can take your own money and just put the rest of it in the 1031 exchange program. But if you do that, that money is now taxable. That's all you have to know about. Okay? All right. So the Treasury Department does not want you as the seller of your old property to have control over the proceeds. I don't know why, but that's the rule. Okay? The money must be used and poured into the replacement property. All right? Which one of the three that you've identified. Okay? This is the basis of the 1031 exchange. Bill, by um, poor, does that mean like we're selling a few of our properties 
and we plan on using the proceeds to buy a vacation rental in Myrtle Beach that we'll actually use to um, live in while we build our house in Myrtle Beach. Um, can we use some of the proceeds to buy the property then some of the proceeds to to improve it, yes? You had to ask a qualified intermediary. I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay. Um, once you hire a, a qualified intermediary, once you're ready to go through the process, you can. That guy is at your beck and call. You can you can ask him a hundred questions if you want, and I did, right? Because what I did on this this is my office building, Executech Suites. It has 47 units in it, right? I sold four separate row homes. I had approximately a hundred thousand dollars in proceeds from each of the four homes. Remember, I started in a business in 1989. I didn't do this deal until 2006, okay? So um, during that time frame, I had, you know, like 15 years to accrue equity in my row homes. And I had more row homes I could have I sold, okay? So when I found this building, I happened to see it on the MLS. I never buy things off the MLS, but I bought this building off the MLS. I knew this building because... Years before I took my real estate, ex uh, my real estate training on how to be a realtor in this building, right? So uh, I was familiar with it uh, because I spent two weeks there taking classes, and they used to have these free bagels that were in the kitchen, and I and I uh, I didn't have any money one day, so I stole one, right? And then when I bought the building, like uh, <laughs> a year later. I said, yeah, I stole a bagel from somebody here, and, and it was the, one of my employees. I, I paid her a dollar for the bagel, but it was like three years later. So anyway, with this building, great story about this building. This building was for sale for $2.3 million. I bought it for $2,150,000, and I did that with only $10,000 in the bank, okay? So you probably like say, how the heck could you do that? Well... The way I did it was, I had a mortgage company that was lined up to lend me all the money I needed for this. But I needed to come up with 475000 in down money to buy this building. I only had $10,000 in the bank at the time I got the building under contract. This kind of thing should never happen. They had these, this big shot firm from downtown Philly called Marcus and Millichap. Marcus and Millichap was charging the sellers of this building $130,000 in commission to represent them in selling the building. So if I backtrack for a second, three years prior to finding this building, I was going around doing what I call call the signs. I drive by a big building. It had a sign out front. Big wooden sign usually says for lease or for sale. So I would call those signs all the time. I used to drive my wife crazy. She'd be like, uh, you know, wh who are you talking to on the phone for a $5 million building? I said, eh, this is some building I drove by. I'm just talking to the guy, right? So I would go to these meetings. You can't go to Harvard and have them teach you about commercial real estate, all right? Because they don't know anything about it, right? You have to learn it. This is a great way to learn it for free. So I would go into these meetings, and the first meetings I would go to, the guy would sit, the owner would say, we have a really good cam here. I'm thinking, what the hell's a cam, right? And I'd get him to explain it to me. And then the next building that I called, I'd go, what's your cam? How's your cam? And that's how I learned, that's how I learned about how commercial buildings are evaluated. There's only a, a number, a couple of formulas. For the most part, they're pretty easy. Once you learn them, it's a piece of cake, right? So by the time I had found this building, I was just like Mr. Cool. I came walking in like, yeah, no problem, no problem. Yeah, I got some money in a 1031 exchange. I, I, I'm going to roll it right into this deal. So no problem getting the money. And these two realtors let me get the building, a $2.1 million asset under contract without ever showing them the money. Just idiots. They should... If you're a realtor, you never, ever do that, okay? 
before you ever allow your seller to sign a contract selling a building to somebody else, your very first question is, I want to see the money. I want to see your credit report. I want to know. I, I, want, I don't want some screenshot from your bank account. I want real uh, bank statements. I want the manager of that bank to staple his business card to your bank statements so I know this is for real. I could even call him up and talk to him, all right? So the way I bought this building was I sold four separate houses. That gave me 400 grand, right? I only had $10,000 in the bank, so I'm, and I needed $475,000. Where did I get that number from? The mortgage company that was lending me the money said I need uh, $475,000 in cash. So I'm $65,000 short. Well, when you buy a duplex, the security deposit and the last month's rent goes to the buyer, okay? So the first month's rent usually goes right in the pocket of the owner of the building. The owner of the building got the first month's rent, but the last month's rent and the security deposit, that is supposed to go into an escrow account, which, by the way, hardly nobody does, okay? And that money sits in the escrow account. Well, this building had a $42,000 a month rent roll when I bought it. So I, I called up the title company, and I said, you know, I had a copy of all the leases. I called up the title company, and I said, hey, uh... $42,000 a month rent roll, how much money is in security deposit? How much money was in the last month's rent? Well, it was $60,000. I only needed sixty-five, dollars right? That's how I raised the money to buy this building, by selling four houses, putting them in a 1031 exchange, calling the title company and asking for the security deposit in the last month's rent. Now, when I called him, I said, okay, I know that money comes to me, right? He's like, yeah, it comes to you. I said, can it come to me like before the settlement so I can use it as the down money? He goes, well, it sort of kind of just happens at settlement. So it's cool. Yeah, we can do it. I'm like, huh. So if you think about that, I bought a $2.1 million asset with $10,000 in the bank. If, the, if those guys had just asked me one question, hey, Phil, you seem like an interesting guy, but... Uh, we want to see $475,000. If they'd asked me a question, the whole deal would have been dead, right? But he didn't ask. They should have asked. They really screwed up. I mean, the deal went through, so there was no harm, no foul, right? But what if I, I had 90 days in my contract, right, with the clause that allowed me an additional 30, I could have taken their $2 million asset off the market for four months. They never even asked me. They signed the contracts. You need a microphone if you want to ask your question. John? Yeah, people online can't hear you. Use the microphone, please. Uh, we don't want to shut out our online people. <coughs> maybe maybe they were so interested in making the deal to to get the building that uh, that they overlooked it. And I don't know. It had a killer rent roll. Personally, I was wondering why is no one else buying this building? Yeah. Okay, uh, I mean, I got to tell you, great great uh, strategy on your part to be able to use uh, you know the the, the yeah. different uh, the ten thirty one exchange and the and the thing. So I'll tell you something interesting. I okay, so. I learned about real estate playing Monopoly with my mother. My mother was like this brilliant business lady who ran three different businesses, and she used to play Monopoly with me all the time when I was a kid, right? The four houses that I sold, out of the four houses that I sold, two of them were partly green. The one in Parkwood had a green garage door and green shutters, and the, uh, the one on Haldeman had like green siding. So. And my office building, you can see the front of it, it's like, it's like red, like a red hotel, right? It's, it's like Monopoly, and I sold four. You know, I don't know, you think, you, how many did you need in Monopoly? You need four greenhouses. Think about that for a second. That's pretty weird, right? And I'm like, yeah, it's like, it, it is a maroon color red building, right? Now, it's not a hotel, but the whole thing is hilarious to me. Okay. So there's eight steps to a 1031 exchange, okay? You got to sell the property, the initial property that you're getting rid of, okay? 
And then you got to give the capital gains that you get from that property at settlement do not go to you. That money gets wired right to the qualified intermediary or a check is sent to them. Then you have to identify f up to three properties. You have 45 days to find the properties you're going to buy. All right? And you have to sign a duty letter to the qualified intermediary. They just give you this letter. And all it really does is it tells the qualified intermediary to hold this money for me, and these are the three properties that I intend to buy, okay? Then you've got to negotiate with the seller for whatever building it is that you're going to buy. You have to agree on a sales price, and then you have to have your intermediary, uh, your qualified intermediary, fund the new settlement. So the, the money goes to the lawyer, the, the QI, and then the money comes back from the QI to the new settlement. If you never touch the money, it's a, it's a tax-free opportunity for you. Pretty cool deal. Why does the government do this? I'm not completely sure. Probably to, to promote people building and buying real estate and, and people who are moving up in the world who sell properties that maybe they don't want anymore, like a bunch of row homes in Philly, and rolling into something else. What do you got, Larry? The, the reason they do it is because Democrats also buy real estate. They do. <laughs> I assume that they, they like to have a roof over their head. No, they don't want to pay taxes, just like everybody else. Okay. So what happens if you do a 1031 exchange and something goes wrong and you can't buy the three buildings, okay? That's happened to me, because I did two 1031 exchanges with multiple properties being sold in each. One of them went perfectly, my Executech Suites building, right? I still own it today. My wife and my daughter run the whole thing. I never even hardly go there. It's perfect, right? I just get big fat checks from them, which I like, okay? But I did another one where I tried to buy another big office building, and that one, the deal fell apart with the seller. And so what happened was the, I was crying like this picture here because what happened was, first of all, I found out that I couldn't buy the replacement property, all right? It just, the deal fell apart. The QI, the qualified intermediary, he got to keep all of my money for six months. I don't really understand why. I guess it's the way that the uh, government sets that rule because they need to make something. Well, they get to use my money uh, for six months and pay me 1%. I'm sure they were making, they were probably trading stock options or something with it, right? Right? So I don't know why they're allowed to do that, but that's just a guess, okay? Now I also owe the tax on that money because I, it's no longer tax-free. So you get banged with a tax bill that year too. But hey, that's the problem when you make a bunch of money. So if, if you really have a problem with taxes, okay, don't make too much money. All right, let's get into something juicy here. I'm going to share with you what I think is an awesome plan to get rich that's not only smart, but it's easy to execute, okay? Let's talk about it. We got some young people in here. Calvin, how old are you? 19, all right. You have no idea what a great asset that is to be, okay? If Calvin dedicated the next 10 years of his life to buying real estate, let's just say he joined investor schooling, he learned how to buy houses with none of his own money, he learned how to do subject to loans, he learned how to do seller financing, he learned about trust, he learned all these tricks to get paid to buy houses, and he goes on a tear. He becomes one of the greatest students we've ever seen, and he buys himself 25 houses over the next 10 years. It's not a really that hard to believe. It's very possible if somebody was super motivated and, and had the knowledge which you can obtain here and had the energy and, and desire to do it, okay? Somebody could easily do that. I know guys in Philadelphia own four or 500 houses, they were buying a house a week, okay? It's hard to fathom that, but that's what they really did. The point to the story is Calvin goes out and he buys a bunch of property. And over the course of 10 years, 
time just keeps ticking, don't it? It's going to happen no matter what, right? So you might as well be doing something smart to benefit the time that's going to tick by in your life, right? In 10 years, you're probably going to build some pretty awesome equity. I'd say, I'd say Calvin would be guaranteed to be a millionaire even if he only bought half that many houses. Say he only bought 12 houses, okay? 12 and a half houses is all you got to buy, right? You'd be a millionaire, all right? If he bought, if he bought uh, 25 houses, probably worth a couple million. He might be like borderline by a multimillionaire depending on what the market does, okay? So what does Calvin do? He's going to go out and he's going to do a 1031 exchange just like I described. He could go buy an apartment building with 40 units in it if he had $2 million. He could do some, some cool stuff, okay? He could swap his whole portfolio of a bunch of little houses into one giant deal. An apartment building, an office building, a medical building, any kind of commercial real estate. Hey, you want to know what you could get pretty cheap right now? Restaurants. <laughs> Did you say a hospital? Well, I, he, now you're really going major. There was a hospital in Warminster that I once looked at, but it was just like, nah, nah. Uh, I ain't buying a hospital, <laughs> right? Um, if, if Calvin did this, bought 25 houses, I'd say in 10 years, he's 29 in 10 years, oh, got his whole life in front of him, he could very easily have a couple of million dollars in row homes. Would it be easy? Nothing's easy in this world, okay? You're going to deal with having to evict tenants. You're going to have a lot of baloney that goes on. M you know, you'd probably have a much more comfortable life if you did it just in the suburbs but you'd probably make more money if you did it in Philly, okay? But you'd also have a whole lot of problems getting people to pay you, and you'd be evicting people and all these kind of problems if you even were allowed to evict people, like you're not now. Okay, all right, now you take, you know, if the money is never in your possession, it can't be taxed. So your $2 million, it, you don't pay any taxes on it. You find yourself a $2 million building and go buy it. You might find yourself in, in a position where the world is your oyster, okay? Depending on how much rent money a $2 million building should make, it should make good rent money. I'm telling you what, if, when I bought my Executech Suites building, I knew the rent roll was 42000 I knew it. I didn't really get it until people started paying the rent. And it was just like, all these checks were coming to my office. And I'm like, I'm adding them up and doing like a deposit in the bank. And I'm like, there's freaking $17,000 here today. Today, right? It really will blow your mind. You don't realize it like, you know, yeah, sure, I'm, I bought $42,000 a month. And I had no problem getting the mortgage because the rent roll was so strong. I didn't build that rent roll. The previous owner did. They took all the money. They took all the money that they got from the sale of this building and they had this grandiose plan to build a country club, a bunch of freaking houses in, um, in Belize, okay? They bought a piece of property that was infested with monkeys. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not kidding you. They had no roads, they had no electrical power, and they were trying to get me to be their partner on this deal before I had even bought Executech Suites. And I knew that they weren't going to ask me for the money. So I could have just said, yeah, sure, I'll be your partner, right? They were so, like, amateur hour about this thing. Like, let me get this straight. How many monkeys are there? They show me a picture. There's like freaking 10,000 of them. <laughs> like, what are you going to do with them? You're going to go around and shoot monkeys for six months? I don't get it. I mean, that, that can't be good. The whole deal... I, one of the things I asked them is, I said, can I just ask you guys a couple of questions? Have you, ever, have you ever built a property? Have you ever been involved in building of a home? Oh, no, we, ne we never did that. I'm like, how about a shed? Did you, did you ever buy a shed and erect it? In your, I mean, they never had any experience with anything. They're going to do this in another country. They don't even speak the, you know, Belize is like, what, half English, half... Uh, you know, Spanish, I'm not really sure. I'm like, look, man, you know, you got no electrical power, infested with monkeys, no roads. Uh, they lost their ass. They lost it, almost all of it. And I know, don't go 
sorry for them because I got to know them and they were they were really really not good people. They were they um they all all this stuff happened between us. I don't really want to get into too much of it, but they they as soon as they bought my building, it was a non-compete clause, right? That they can't go and compete with me. They um they made up a bunch of stories about me, started telling the tenants that I was a bad guy. They didn't even freaking know me. I was wasn't this, they did this like right away, like 10 days after I bought the place. They didn't even know me. They went around and got a few of the tenants to believe some of these stories, and they went and bought a building two blocks away from me and competed with me, right? They beat me for about $60,000 in rent money, and I just, I, I, I did the only thing I know how to do. I'm a real estate guy, so I just, I just found new tenants, filled up my building, and, and uh, kicked their ass every way I could, Okay. About five years after I bought this building, this guy, Shane, who, for those of you who know me, I've mentioned him before, he was my partner in a wholesale business I had. Shane comes walking into my building one day, and he goes, they did it again. So they got their friends, they told their friends that Phil's a bad guy, and they can't compete with me. So she was going to put the building in, the new building in her name, right? But the funding was going to come from the tenants that she put into this building. And they became her partners, and she swindled them out of all their money, right? So now there's a bunch of lawsuits against her and the whole bit. I knew she was rotten from day one. I just, I, I, I just sensed it, you know? Uh, but anyway, this is the kind of stuff you got to look out for. You can never believe... When you're buying a commercial property, it goes for residential property too. You can never believe what the seller tells you. You have to check everything. When I was buying Executech Suites, I, I told them, I want to see your credit report. I want to see your bank statements. I want to see your cash. I want to see your tax returns. I want everything, right? And then they said, well, look, we'll just have our accountant talk to your, your accountant. So I got... Uh, this guy, John Hepner, who was one of the smartest accountants I knew. And I paid John handsomely to sit in a conference room and go over all these numbers and make sure everything was perfect. So they're sitting in there for like three hours. I'm just listening. And their accountant had a reasonable explanation for almost everything. They were doing some funny stuff with the money, but a lot of sellers do that, okay? They, they put a kitchen in their primary residence and make it look like it was in the office building. Okay, that's just no big deal. I don't care about that. That's what they want to do. So after about three hours of going through all this stuff, my accountant says to me, hey, Phil, are you satisfied? I said, no, keep going for another hour and a half. This is, I just wanted to be absolutely sure, right? So let's talk about finish this conversation, all right? 45 days, you designate the three properties you want to buy. You must close on one of them in uh, one of the three in the six-month time frame, all right? Now, <clears throat> now you bought this big commercial building. Calvin's got himself a $2 million building. What do you do next? You're going to do the value play, okay? You want to look for a building, all right, that has something that you can improve on it that you can provide value to this building that's going to make it make more money. Why is that important? Because when you go to sell your new building, your new building is valued on how much rent money it makes. That's the primary thing it's valued on. Commercial buildings don't necessarily get valued like residential. They're not valued on comps. Usually you can't even find a comp for a commercial property because they're so unique from property to property. All right? It's all about the rent money. So I bought, this is just another building. I'm trying to show you what a value play is. I bought this apartment building. It's a seven-unit apartment building. It's what we call a garden variety apartment building. You walk in the front door, you go down half a flight of steps or up half a flight of steps. So it's three stories, three apartments in the basement or studio apartments, and then upstairs are two very big one-bedroom apartments and the same thing on the third floor. Two big one-bedroom apartments. The first thing I noticed about this building was that they had this gigantic oil heater in the basement that was costing me $8,700 a year because it was included in the rents. All right? So in the summertime, I took this 
Peter, which was already on its deathbed anyway. It was dying, and I ripped the whole thing out of the building. Okay? I brought an electrician to put in brand new circuit panels in every one of the apartments, and then I put electric heaters in every one of the units. So what did I do? $8,700 a year expense to me goes down to zero. I'm not providing the heat anymore. I upgrade their circuit panels, put in these brand new electric heaters, and now my building is making $8,700 a year more because I've reduced my expenses that much, right? I put 15 grand into the control panels and the electric heaters, paid for itself in two years. I used to sell million dollar tunnel ovens to bakeries. Their whole justification was, Phil, this equipment has to pay for itself in two years. That's what big companies typically do. I just took that philosophy and did it. Point is, you buy a property where there's some kind of change that you can make and make that building make a lot more money. And if you can do that, you may have just put another million bucks in your pocket, okay? Just by buying smart, buying something that you can add value to to make it make more money. <sighs> I think I'm done.